31st meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's briefing via teleconference or video conference. Um, and our witnesses for today's briefing will also be um, by a video conference. And I, I'd like to officially welcome back Stuart Dixon uh, from uh, his return to his after um, being off of illness. Um, just to highlight that this morning's meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage and on the assembly website. Um, and just to remind members to mute their tablet devices by pushing F4. Um, so moving on then to item number one, um, apologies, we have no apologies this morning. No apologies. We may now have a bit of an issue with our briefing. We have Sharon, but we may have lost the other official. Okay. We're having some issues around that, but if we proceed, we should have Sharon. Okay. Um, so move on then to item number two, our draft minutes. Um, there are copies of draft minutes at page five of your pack for the 15th of July. Are members content that those are an accurate reflection? Great. Um, there is also a record of decisions for the fifth meeting on the 15th of July at page 7 of your pack. Are members content with those? Great. And then there is a copy of draft minutes um, from the meeting held on the 26th of August at page 10. Are members content with those? Great, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to item number three, chairperson's business. Obviously, this week we have heard the speculation around the internal market bill, which is due to be published today. Um, obviously, that has been destabilising um, in terms of what we might expect over the next number of weeks. We had expected Brexit obviously to feature highly on our agenda anyway, but we are looking potentially to move around some of our business. And next week, um, Dr. Katie Hayward has agreed to brief the committee um, in what is anticipated to be published in the bill today. So are members content with that? Great, look forward to it. Um, also, um, at the beginning of this week, I think on Monday, we had a motion passed in the Assembly calling on the British Government to extend the furlough scheme. So I'd like to propose that the committee also writes um, in support of that. It's fine, yeah. And um, we raised a number of times the self-employed income support scheme as well, um, and those who've been excluded from that. Um, we would also like to see that extended, so I'd like to propose that the committee would write and express their yep, views around that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So moving on then to item number four. Are we okay, Peter, to go yeah. ahead? So departmental Sharon. briefing um, on bids tendered to the executive around economic recovery. There is a clerk's memo at page 15 of your pack. There's a departmental briefing paper at page 18 and a further departmental briefing on the economic recovery in the medium term at page 45. Um, the Minister announced that applications would open today on some of the bids under Invest NI. So maybe I'll ask the officials about that as well when, when um, they are speaking to us. So I'd like to bring into the spotlight then Ms Sharon Hetherington, um, Director of Finance of DFE, Michelle Scott, EU Exit and International Trade, and Pierce McCann, EU Exit Resources. Well, there we go. We've got everybody. Right. So I'll, if I hand over to you to make an opening statement and then we'll open it up to members. Um, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm joined by my colleagues, as you said, Michelle Scott and Pierce McCann. Um, the paper members have in front of them this morning describes my department's response to the exercise commissioned by the Department of Finance to allocate additional funding received from the Barnet Consequentials as a result of the Chancellor's um, summer statement. DOF asked the bid submitted in respect of this exercise focused on economic recovery. So the paper sets out details of the bids that have been submitted and the annexes provide detail on the purpose of each bid and how economic recovery is supported. I won't repeat the detail um, in these introductory remarks, but I'll briefly summarise for you the headline figures. In total, and round up to the nearest millions, our Minister has approved 32 bids under 13 themes, totalling 78 million, and there are also six inescapable pressures, totalling 10 million in 2021. These bids and inescapable pressures have a combined future funding requirement of 63 million up to 2023-24. These bids are considered to be significantly important in addressing economic recovery. Some are interventions that go beyond March 21, as we know economic recovery will not be able to stop at that point. 
The Minister is looking to longer term interventions and wishes to do all she can within the confines of her budget to support economic recovery. Those interventions will require funding commitment from the Executive to fund the future year costs. The bids are all considered strong bids and have been assessed by a DFE departmental panel in advance of review by the Economy Minister. The Minister believes the bids should not be viewed individually but as a package of support measures and the bids are in line with the Department's economic recovery strategy. In addition to the bids submitted to the Department of Finance, the Minister has made capital Dell allocations of £6.2 funding four bids entirely and funding the capital elements of two of the bids. After taking these capital allocations into account, the Minister has been able to declare a £10 million reduced requirement to be returned to the Department of Finance for reallocation across other departments. As part of this exercise, my department identified no resource Dell savings, but this is hardly surprising as the department will be at the forefront of the Executive's long-term economic response to the pandemic. It is worth mentioning that DFE received £23 million of funding when the Executive made a number of urgent allocations. £17 million was received for apprenticeships, £5.5 million was to provide a safe learning environment in further education, and £430,000 was received and to cover the costs of providing free school meals within the further education sector. Chair, that is a quick summary of the paper you have in front of you. Michelle Pierce and I would be happy to do our best to answer any questions you might have and to provide additional clarification and explanation. Where we cannot give you precise or complete answers, we'll be happy to write to the clerk and provide the necessary explanations. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I guess, first of all, you, you highlighted that the bids um, reflect the economic recovery strategy. And I guess um, if I reflect on the economic recovery um, paper, there, there's little in the way of objectives within it. There's little in, in the way of detail. Um, and I, I guess a, a, a criticism I would have of the paper is it doesn't clearly link to the other strategies that the department is currently working on or, or has in place. It makes some mention of the likes of the skills strategy. Um, and while there are bids in, in this paper you know, around skills and there are, there are good bids around skills, it would... I think there is a, a kind of lack of clarity around how these bids clearly link to what is being brought forward in terms of economic recovery. Um, and I, I guess to some extent there, you know, there's a, a bit of a, a lack of ambition around some of this. Um, and I, I, I would kind of wonder, um, you know, in terms of the developing the economic recovery, um, when can we expect to see uh, an executive endorsed economic recovery strategy? Um, well, I think in, in terms of the bids and how they're linked to the strategy, um, that was something that the departmental um, led panel did assess. Uh, you know, and, and there was criteria examined there. Um, you know, you've made a point around perhaps the lack of ambition within the bids. Um, you, you know, what the situation that we were in uh, are in as a department is that this money has been allocated and needs to be spent by the 31st of March. So obviously, um, in thinking about um, ambition, I suppose, to maybe have some new interventions, the time span there um, in itself sort of limits what, um, as a department, you know, we can take forward and actually get up and running and implement it and spent um, by the 31st of March. Um, Michelle, is leading on the economic recovery piece, so I maybe just pass over to her um, for for some comments uh, on the further sort of more longer term aspects of that. She's on mute. She's muted. Yeah. Apologies. <laughs> Can you hear me now, Chair? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Chair, for the question. In terms of the allocations that have been made in year, um, we did assess them against the um, the sorry the rebuilding a stronger economy document. Um, we also assessed them because, as Sharon said, these bids had to be spent in year. Um, so there was a limit to what we could do as, an, as a department to get interventions and actions um, implemented within that short time scale. So we assessed the bids against 
four main criteria, and they were whether they addressed and identified COVID-19 economic impact, um, whether that spend was achievable in the year, um, the potential for that intervention to deliver value for money, um, and the potential for it to support PFG outcomes, as well as delivering against the principles of rebuilding a stronger economy. Um, as a department, we are also now looking to the spending review period. Um, we will be able to um, develop more interventions which are, are in line with the overarching principles of the rebuilding a stronger economy. Um, Chair, you also asked about when there would be an executive endorsed recovery plan. Um, TEO are leading on that work at the moment. Um, my understanding is that recovery framework, which will pull together the recovery plans across government departments, um, will be submitted to the executive for consideration this Thursday. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and like, as, I, as I highlighted, there are some good bits in there in relation to, uh, for example, skills. Um, we also seen the, the announcements yesterday in relation of, to the Invest NI um, projects that they are, I think they actually opened for application this morning. Could you maybe expand a wee bit on those uh, and where they fit in with the bids that are being made in relation to, to business support here? Certainly, Chair. The announcements that were made yesterday in relation to the COVID-19 Digital Selling Capability Grant um, and the Equity Investment Fund were actually bids that were brought forward through the June monitoring process. Um, they were assessed in the same way as the bids were assessed in this summer budget update. Um, we looked, we had a strong suite of bids that we funded both through um, reallocation of internal departmental money and then bidding um, to DOF to the centre for the balance of that funding. Um, so those two, those two bids were strong bids funded through that money um, and are, not, are now in the process, um, are, are about to open. Um, if you want to, I mean, the COVID-19 Digital Selling Capability Grant, which is a great name, um, and that is specifically aimed at helping retail and wholesale, wholesale businesses um, better, ask, better access consumer demand and grow online sales. Um, there is a similar scheme being inter, uh, um, introduced by Intertrade Ireland, which will complement um, that provision. Um, the COVID-19 Equity Investment Fund, and that is funded through financial transactions capital. So that is loan and equity funding, and that is to help emerging businesses um, who are experiencing difficulty under the current climate access um, funding. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess just on that particular point in relation to emerging businesses, um, what, what is, I suppose, somewhat striking in this paper is there are no bids in relation to some of those who were excluded from the, the previous um, schemes. Are we expecting any further bids to be made in relation to those? The bids that you have in front of you, Chair, are the totality of the bids made, made by the Department for the Economy um, to the COVID summer budget exercise. In terms of, of any proposals to expand um, existing schemes that, and, and those grant schemes that were introduced in the early stages of the COVID response, um, that will be an issue for the executive to consider um, a, a, as a whole and will be considered through the ongoing work on the economic recovery framework, which I referred to in my last answer. Okay, thank you. So the, the Department for the Economy hasn't put forward any bids <laughs> in relation to, to those? There was, in terms of this summer budget exercise, the bids within the paper submitted to you are our bids. There has been ongoing engagement um, with the executive on options um, around those schemes. However, that is being considered as a separate exercise to, to this exercise. Okay. Um, I'm going to pass over then to other members. Um, John Stewart. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, folks, for your presentation so far. Can I echo your sentiments and uh, Sharon that, yeah, there are some um, good schemes in here, some good bids for projects. And I suppose I'd like to see a little bit more about how they do link up. It would be good to see that as part of the economic framework and the recovery strategy as, as to how these all do interlink. I suppose it would be good to get a longer presentation on that. But I can't help but echo as well the concerns that there is clearly, again, a distinct lack of a bid for a second hardship grant to support those who have to date missed out on any support to date. I, print, I print, appreciate, Michelle, what you say that that's part of an executive strategy, but surely it's down to the Department of the Economy to lead in that, given that the previous hardship grant was led by the Department of Economy. And when we see over £50 million worth of money being returned from unspent grants, surely 
an opportunity would have been to repackage that into a speed ready project that could have targeted those who had to date been unable to access self-employment support or hardship grants or grants of 10 or 25 thousand pounds to date so that is very very frustrating and will be another body blow to those who have to date been excluded and i wonder in my question when you talk about the four reasons for um a, pro a bid being uh, put forward and being assessed one of those is being value for money when we heard from the permanent secretary two weeks ago that potentially grant support of the state has not been seen as value for money because either businesses that are going to go bust are going to go bust or if they've survived this far will survive is that one of the rationales for that being the case is that the department's um, understanding of additional grant support at this stage thank you thank you um, well certainly as in the context of this exercise we have been considering bids um in, in support of rebuilding a stronger economy. Um, those bids, as, as you say, um, are being considered by the executive as part of a separate um, parallel process. Um, it, in, in terms of, given the level of expenditure required for schemes of that nature, they have a cross-cutting nature um, and therefore will, will need to be considered collectively by the executive. Okay. I mean, I suppose just whenever when we hear a good news story, like the Department of Economy putting out a hardship grant, they were 10 and 25, the department take responsibility, but when one's not taken or um, made available, then it's the executive's responsibility. So I suppose it, for those who are just wanting answers, it can be quite frustrating. Um, but I, I, basically, there was no bid put in for a hardship, for a supplementary hardship grant from that return grant funding, is what we're saying. Not, not as part of this exercise in front of us today. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the funding then, um, we talked about this year and having to be spent before the end of March. Is there any of that funding recurrent funding that will be required for projects going year to year? And is that money available then supplement uh, in addition to this? Well, I'll, I'll pass you back to Sharon to talk about the detail of that. There are a number of bids which will have tails um, going forward. Um, and if, if I recall correctly, and Sharon, Sharon will correct me on this, um, that's in relation to the skills bids. Um, and obviously we need to consider as a department and the executive will need to consider how they, how they are funded going forward. Um, a, a large number of these bids are simply in year. Uh, and that's, that, that's why we're keen to get this funding allocated and get interventions on the ground and up and running. Um, but I'll pass back to Sharon for the detail of those tales. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, the bids do have t uh, financial tales and um, sort of some tales quite into the future. And you'll see from the briefing paper there, they really require commitments of almost 63 million up to 2023-24. And there is ongoing um, recurrent commitment of eight, just over 8 million per annum. So I think that's why whenever we have submitted um, our bids to the Department of Finance, you know, we've tried to be quite clear about that. And while this is an exercise to allocate funding up to the 31st of March, I think there is a recognition that you know, recovery can't stop at the 31st of March and, you know, where it is sensible to put measures in place now and such as the um, apprenticeship bids, um, you know, it wouldn't be sensible not to put those forward just because there are financial tails. Um, but from the department's perspective, um, you know, we need to highlight like that to the Department of Finance um, and we need to say, look, th there is a requirement um, for a funding commitment that really can't be met within the existing departmental baseline. Um, but equally, you know, it wouldn't be sensible not, not to proceed with some of these interventions. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. If I could just make one last point, not a question, I just I want to get it across at the end of the Department to the Minister that there does need to be another scheme created for additional business support, particularly for those out of the state. And if that can't be done with the department with executive approval, then I want the department and the minister to send a strong message if it hasn't already been done to your executive colleague that is imperative that another scheme is created, using that money that had already been created for grant support. Thank you. Let's get that on the record. Thanks, John. Um, John O'Dowd? Oh. Uh, thank you. Um, I have to say, I, I uh, don't accept that it's not the Department of Economy's responsibility or, indeed, it's the Department of Economy 
has to take the lead. I, I accept that the Department of Economy has to take the lead on regard to those who have been left behind in terms of grants uh, and uh, funding over the, over this last six months. I, I'm a previous executive minister. I know how the executive works. There is no position the executive can take in relation to an individual department unless that department brings forward the proposals. So I think it's fair to say that the minister has decided not to support those, those businesses and individuals who have, who have been left behind. And I think it's, uh, the minister needs to come forward and the department needs to come forward and say that and give us the rationale behind that. There may be a rationale behind it. There may be a perfectly legitimate economic and policy decision not to do that. But we as a committee can't scrutinise that unless the minister and our officials come forward and say we have decided not to do it. Instead of coming forward with this line, that's an executive uh, decision. It's not an executive decision. It's an economy decision. Uh, and it's an economy proposal that needs to come forward. No comment? No. No, um, sorry, I wasn't sure if you had finished. Sorry. Um, no, well, I mean, my comment to that um, would be that it is my understanding, and I mean, I joined the department on the 1st of June, so it was, it slightly preceded me, but it was my understanding that the grant schemes that were set up in the first place were an executive decision, and the executive is collectively Correct. looking at COVID measures. Um, I suppose we, we're in unprecedented times. Um, so I, I think as Michelle has, has referred earlier, um, you know, it, my understanding is this is being discussed at the executive. Yes, an executive decision based on proposals from individual departments. Unless a proposal comes forward, the executive will not make a collective decision in regards to that matter. So I, I think I would ask you to reflect this back to your minister. In my opinion, a decision has been made not to fund those who have been left behind, for want of a better term. If that decision, and that decision has been made, then let's hear the rationale for it and allow the committee to examine that rationale and for the committee to pass judgment on it. Because we're not fooling anybody with this uh, game of table tennis back and forth, or it's your responsibility, or it's my responsibility. It, it, nobody buys it anymore, so let's get the decision out and let's scrutinise it. The, the other question I wanted to ask you, just in regards to the funding packages that have been brought forward, there's quite a significant amount of money has been set aside for advertisement um, in, in relation to tourism, etc. Uh, and I accept our tourism sector has been hit particularly bad by this, uh, and we need uh, customers and clients through the doors in regards to that matter. But it, has the balance been struck properly in terms of the amount of money being spent on advertisement and the amount of money which is going directly uh, to, to um, the, the, the industry in terms of whether it's hotels or wherever it may be? So I'm just wondering, I, I have a slight concern in my head the balance hasn't been struck properly. Sorry, the sound quality um, isn't great, but I think it's a got the gist of your question you're asking about um, the marketing spend on tourism and is the balance right now? That's right, yeah, that's it, yeah. Sorry, can I just cut in a wee second? Can I ask anyone who isn't actually speaking to put themselves on mute? It might help with the, the sound issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, I'll refer to Michelle for the detail mm. of this, but I think um, you'll see there within the briefing paper where we have provided you um, with a synopsis of the bids and um, you, you know the, the research um, would bear out that spend on marketing activity to try and um, bring the tourism sector back to where it was pre-COVID um, you, you know that that is a very clear way um, of trying to um, regenerate um, that, that sector, but I will, mm. I'll pass you over to Michelle, maybe to give you a bit more detail. Thanks, Sharon. Um, you know, certainly, in, in terms of the support to this sector, you'll be aware that in terms of the grant schemes um, that, that were established by the department, there was a £25,000 grant to retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure. Um, the bid you have before you have, have rightly pointed that, that there are a number of advertising campaigns 
to support and regenerate um, the tourism industry, which, which, as you know, has has had a very difficult time as a result of the um, of the COVID um, controls put in place. Um, these are bids that have come forward from Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland. Um, they feel very strongly, um, and, and we're, we're we're very supportive of these bids. That um, marketing was the way to help the sector through this difficult period. Um, there, there is a time delay in terms of a, a lag in terms of when you market. Um, so if I recall correctly, and, and Pierce will be able to jump in um, if I've got this wrong, but the marketing undertaken now is for the next season, um, by which stage the, the industry would hope things would be operating more normally. Um, but they do need to get those advertisements, that marketing out now um, to secure the next season. And um, Pierce, is there anything you have to add um, on those comments? Uh, yes. What, what I would say is is that the, the bid that um, Tourism Northern Ireland, uh, the four million pound bid that they have put forward in this exercise, is informed by a a research and insights program that they have been um, working on. So at June monitoring, the department allocated half a million pounds to do this research and insights work, and I understand that the, the marketing bids that have been put forward now are informed by this, this research and insights work that has been ongoing and continues to be ongoing. You'll also note that there is another bid of £125,000 um, to supplement the research and insights uh, bid that was granted back in June. So th this will allow for better data analytics and, and more uh, current information. So, so the bids put forward are, in, are informed bids based on research and insights. Um, it's probably worth noting as well that Tourism NI uh, does marketing for Northern Ireland in the Ireland of Ireland. The, the other uh, marketing bid from Tourism Ireland will market um, Northern Ireland across uh, GB and internationally, as I understand. And I think that's what you were referring to there, Michelle, is that whilst that business isn't expected to come in immediately, and um, it will be the island of Ireland market um, that we rely on this year, uh, the money spent um, by Tourism Ireland will hopefully generate uh, tourism uh, business um, next year and, and beyond. Just a final point. We're spending £4 million based on research, and we're going to spend another £125,000 to get more research. I sort of query in terms of my head. Uh, I would like to think the research that got the £4 million bid was solid, and we didn't need any more for, further research, but I never. Okay, thank you. And look, just um, if I can pick up on the point around tourism, and I guess it would bring me back to the point I made at the start, how, how these things interlink and fit into our, our economic recovery um, strategy. Um, it would have been useful to see, and maybe this is something that we can, you know, we can discuss at a, at a further date as well, how these bids actually fit together. Because in the skills bids, there's talk about interventions that ensure employers continue to have access to people with skills and qualifications. Um, and obviously, the, the recovery of the likes of the tourism sector, um, you know, we need we need to have more people skilled in particular areas in tourism uh, and similarly there's mention um, in one of the other bids around the digital and green technologies um, and how those bids around skills actually fit with the bids to do with um, business support. Uh, is there anything additional perhaps that you, you could um, tell us around that? Well, certainly, Chair, we're happy to come back um, with a written response, just, just linking those bids under the priorities as you see them in the Rebuilding a Stronger Economy document. Really, the, the Rebuilding a Stronger Economy framework was looking at how how we can focus on the higher value added sectors and um, what skills will be required once we have made our way through this very difficult lockdown period and beyond. So it was looking to the next 18 months to two years. Um, what we see in front of us here in terms of bids, there are some more immediate um, in, in terms of the time frame, and I think that is right and proper um, that we respond, particularly as, the, as these bids cover the next six months um, and are just in year. Um, in terms of looking at the spending review period, which we will 
which will cover three years in terms of resource funding and four years in terms of capital, there will be a greater opportunity to look at longer term interventions. Um, but Chair, we're more than happy to come back um, with, with a written brief um, just linking the, these bids through to the Rebuilding a Stronger Economy document, if that would be helpful. Gary, can you bring Gary in the spotlight? Gary isn't happy with the sound. You're probably aware of that. Oh, there he is. Can you hear us okay, Gary? I think the sound. I can indeed, Chair. Thank you. It did improve slightly. Maybe there were some um, microphones that were still on mute. Um, th thanks uh, for those briefings. I suppose my question is around, and I do welcome the bids. I think you know they, they are important. Uh, and I think that that must be said. And saying that, obviously, um, there's always things that we would like to see and uh, things that we, we don't see in these particular bids. Um, and there's probably a reason for that. Um, in terms of, you know, what, what is your opinion in terms of these bids and these interventions? How will they go to um, support jobs? You know, I, I know I notice a number of the bids, for example, there, the tourism bids, there's um, uh, a voucher scheme being talked about. These are all good initiatives. But my main concern is, is around our town and city centres. How do we, um, you know, how do you see these bids ensuring that you know, jobs are um, in within our town and city centres? And, and how, how do you see these bids ensuring that we can get life back into our city centres as well? Chair, if, if, if I may take that question, Sharon. I mean, Certainly, looking at the bids, there is a mix um, here, as we would expect, given given the, the the breadth of policy interventions from the department. Um, you've rightly pointed to the tourism voucher scheme, um, which is about stimulating demand in the market and and helping that that sector recover, getting people out, getting people spending money. Um, similar, I suppose, to the eat out to help out scheme, um, which which we saw over the over the summer months. Um, so there is a mix of that type of intervention, and then um, interventions to help small, medium and micro businesses innovate and, and respond to the current um, COVID crisis. I mean, the, the first the first bit there, um, Fast Start, which is to help Northern Ireland companies in the blue zone, um, that is about helping technology companies um, of any size um, undertake innovation and R&D. So clearly, while, while initially that will be about um, research, um, developing new products, there will be employment opportunities generated by the, that type of intervention. Um, I'm just, just looking down, down the list here. And in terms of there, there's a really good suite of programs there for skills. And that, that is about helping the sector respond um, to the changes in demand, the changes in opportunities like apprenticeships um, as a result of the current and projected impacts on unemployment levels in Northern Ireland. Um, we, we were limited um, in terms of this exercise as what we can deliver in year. And we, we will be upfront about that um, in terms of the likes of what, what our bodies, the likes of Invest and I, could put forward. They were very clear as to what they could deliver and only wanted to bid for those, those interventions that they could actually follow through and achieve the spend. There is a credibility issue in terms of departments if we go in and bid big, big for this type of exercise and then aren't able to spend. Um, and it's already um, becoming increasingly challenging with every day that passes. Um, so so, so I, will, I will accept the bids have been limited um, by that. However, I think there's a good mix here um, to support employment and um, help support our economy through this. Okay, uh, Michelle, that was actually very useful. Um, in terms of, obviously, a lot of committee members have raised the issue around those who uh, have been excluded. Um, obviously, uh, and that is a genuine concern. I know the Minister uh, will be meeting with uh, some of those uh, factors in the very near future, and I think that's important to do so. But in terms of, and again, back to the town and city centre issue, uh, you know, when I go into uh, the town and city centre that I represent, um, you know, I, I see the sandwich bars and your coffee shops, your, your barbers, your hairdressers, they're not operating to capacity uh, because a lot of office workers aren't, aren't back. That's one reason. Um, and of course, they shouldn't be back unless it's safe to do so. Um, but th those businesses are actually getting to the point where potentially either they close or they will need further support. And I think of, for example, the hospitality or wet pubs. 
Um, you know, and, and those are, and despite what some members would say, those are executive decisions because there's not agreement at the executive in terms of when these wet pubs should reopen. Uh, and if, if, if the decision's been made not to reopen them, then of course, I think it's fair to say that there should be something for them in terms of uh, ensuring that they, they can be kept afloat. So it's just in terms of your thoughts, how flexible is the system to allow for in the next two months when we see the furlough scheme, uh, hopefully it's, it'll be extended, but at the minute it's not going to be. How flexible are we to respond then to the significant number of job losses that's going to be in the horizon? Well, well clearly, and as you, as you have said there, these are issues that involve significant funding requirements um, and will need to be considered by the executive through their ongoing work on, on the recovery framework. I mean, certainly in relation to wet pubs, absolutely aware of the difficulties there. Um, I understand the, sorry, I just had something in front of me there. Um, I understand the, the junior ministers and, and the first and deputy first minister have been considering this issue. Uh, and obviously the, there are a number of factors at play when, when they will be able to reopen um, what impact that will have. Um, and as I say, it, it will be an issue that will need to be considered by the executive um, as part of that ongoing work on the, the cross-departmental um, strategy and response. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, everyone, for your contribution. Can you clarify just where it is set at the moment? These bids sit, I understand, with the Department of Finance, and have been for some time. Uh, and uh, can you clarify, does that include the 52 million that was returned from the grant scheme? Is, it, is that the case? Um, yes, the 53 million that was um, the underspend from the grant scheme, that has been returned to the centre and will form part of the allocation for this exercise here. Uh, my understanding is that the executive um, hope to consider these allocations um, at the executive meeting tomorrow. How long have these bids been in the system with the Department of Finance? Um, there, as I said in the briefing paper, the bids were first submitted at the end of July and then there was a request for further information um, which we prepared and that was submitted to the Department of Finance on the 1st of September. Um, but I've also, um, as I sort of drew attention in my opening comments, um, as well as noted in the paper, the executive um, did take the decision to make a number of urgent allocations um, over, over the summer um, while they pause to consider some more information and how these bids would sit in with the work that the executive office is doing and sort of overarching Northern Ireland recovery strategy. So they've been with the Department of Finance since July then? In, in the main? The, 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 first, the first iteration of the exercise was submitted at the end of July. Okay, right. Um, there are priorities, different priorities, priority one and so on, one, two, three. Are they being dealt with in, in a priority system as such, or the, are we picking and choosing? Sorry, um, the departmental panel assessed all our bids, and I think, um, as I said in the opening statement, um, you know, we view them as a suite of bids um, that are interlinked and would like them all to be supported. Um, the Department of Finance requested that um, bids should be submitted in priority order and no two bids should have the same priority. Um, so as a result, uh, we, we did that um, piece of work. Um, and I think we did find that difficult as a department because I think all the bids we felt were strong bids. Um, but we had to make an assessment on their priorities in order to comply with what the Department of Finance had requested to allow us um, to sort of complete the exercise to allocate the funding. Um, so the priorities were set out and you'll see that we have tried to set them within themes um, so that when the Department of Finance are considering them, they will look at them in that order. Okay, right, thank you. Um, the tourism budget uh, is significant and I think we all recognise the need for it. We're very much aware of the, the lack of tourists uh, this year and there are a number of hotels that are still lying empty, huge hotels and there's uh, little or no income. 
And again, it takes me on to the, my main concern is about the furlough scheme, which has been stepped down, and we're trusting, we're praying that it will be continued. What arrangements are there there if the furlough scheme was to uh, sadly end, and what further support would there be for for business? And my other worry would be uh, about manufacturing. Uh, we have a lot of people in manufacturing and are still on furlough. Um, the demand for manufacturers sadly reduced, and if the furlough scheme was to stop, what plans are made and what has been done? And I made this point before about Invest NI. What have they done to support um, well, businesses? I mean, I think it is concerning that the furlough scheme will end, and we know that you know a numbers a number of sectors within our econ economy have yet to open up or open up fully. Um, and and sectors are making use of that furlough scheme. Um, as you're aware, the, the use of the furlough scheme is being discussed at the executive and also with the um, UK government. Um, I, I suppose that would really be an executive decision if nor you know to decide if Northern Ireland is going to have something to supplement that if there isn't something forthcoming from Treasury. I think. You know that the, the finance minister is still in negotiations with Treasury um, on that. Um, while I think there has been no response to date, um, but it probably is important for the economy. Um, Michelle, would you like to add anything? Michelle, you're still on mute. Apologies. Um, just really that um, I, I, I understand and the department understands the concerns um, around the ending of the furlough scheme um, and the significant amount of employees at the moment in Northern Ireland who are um, availing of that scheme. I think it's just under um, 250,000 workers and a further 78,000 workers, um, well, self-employed individuals through the equivalent um, scheme for self-employed. Um, it is a concern. Um, obviously, the executive share that concern and the finance minister has written to Treasury, um, as Sharon has, has referred to there. Um, in terms of the supports that, that we can implement, um, th those in front of you and those we will be considering as part of the spending review process um, are obviously not in the scale of the furlough scheme, um, and that simply would not be uh, affordable within departmental budgets. Um, however, what we have done here is attempt uh, is put forward those interventions that we believe will assist the economy through this difficult time. Um, but I accept that they're not to the scale of that the, the furlough scheme. Okay, thank you. Just go back on the tourism thing. Do you feel that um, the promotion and the mention has been made about? Uh, four million pounds on advertising and, and promotion. Do you really feel that that will make an impact and we will be able to keep the stication thing going and, and build on that to, to try and, and obviously boost the economy locally by, by uh, encouraging our own people to, to ha take breaks and, and holidays really to, throughout Ireland? I, I absolutely do think we, we need to compete. We're competing on an all-island island basis for, for tourism. Um, it is a difficult time for the sector. We need to show Northern Ireland in the best light um, as, a, as a place to come, as a place to stay for your holiday. Um, certainly, I mean, if Pierce has anything to add to that, um, he went through the the, the, the tourism bids in detail. Um, however, I, as a department, we are very supportive of that bid. Yeah, ju just just uh, what I would like to add is, you know, there is the, the four million advertising bid, but but what we also have is we have a we are good to go scheme. That scheme is uh, designed to build confidence, consumer confidence, in that those tourism businesses that sign up to this uh, charter mark, um, that that they are COVID safe and ad adhering to the guidelines. So, and, and it's trying to make the consumer understand that those businesses are COVID safe. So that, that is there to build confidence. We then have the voucher scheme, which is there along with the advertising schemes to generate demand. And our colleagues in tourism Northern Ireland have uh, assured us that this is what is needed uh, for that sector. Okay, no, I would welcome that. Uh, we're good to, to go. It sounds good, but it also is all about uh, instilling confidence, I think. And, in the public out there, that, that businesses are 
uh, operating their their day-to-day -day work in a safe and um, hygienic environment. I think we would all want that confidence if you go into an hotel to make sure the room is clean and has been clean. So I suppose it comes back to basic quality standards and good housekeeping, but people want an assurance that that's happened. And I think if we get that, those measures, 350,000 is, three, is allocated there for that. So, yes. yeah. So I suppose it's a nominal amount of money, but I suppose it's about about marketing, get the message out. But I would welcome that. Finally, Chair, I would make the point about the the, um, the much talked about small business owners and self-employed people. I think all of us genuinely have put a lot of effort into that in this committee over the last uh, year, and I think we're all very supportive of trying to fill the gaps that have been mentioned and it has been talked about and I think we've all spent the summer working on it here as well and I think we, we will continue to work with the Minister and, and her staff and officials to try and address that issue. It is difficult, the, the criteria I suppose that it, of other schemes wasn't met and we all know the criteria was very tight and very sometimes very unreasonable to be honest but uh, I think we all genuinely recognise that they're, they're, you know, we need to try and, and address that issue, but um, and we'll continue to do that. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, can I just pick up on a wee point um, around the tourism, um, the, the, the spend, and John mentioned it around the, um, the research, um, and in relation to the consumer confidence, is that something that is ongoing? And maybe this isn't for your, a question for yourselves, but is there ongoing research being conducted around consumer confidence to kind of assess if that good to go scheme is actually, you know, delivering. Can you um, answer that? Thanks. Yes, um, I, I am aware that there is ongoing research um, at the at the minute, and um, I know that the output of that research is being uh, put up on Tourism NI's website. Whether or not the what has been output so far relates to consumer confidence, um, I would have to come back to you on that. I just have that detail at this time. That's fine, thank you. Um, Claire, can we bring Claire into the spotlight please? Oh, there she is. Hi, good morning. Sorry Chair, I um, wasn't on mute for some reason there. Um, thank you everyone uh, for your presentations and your responses so far. Um, I do think it is important to labour the point that other members have met, met, uh, made in, in relation to bringing items to the executive table. Um, I, I appreciate in respect of what you have said so far that it will be a Northern Ireland executive decision, but you know, will you confirm for me who actually triggers that conversation? Um, and given that you know, what, what we're discussing um, is very much usually led by the Department for the Economy and the Minister for the Economy, Will she trigger that conversation at the executive table or will it, will it be the chair, uh, the joint chairs of, of the executive committee, the first and deputy first minister? Um, I appreciate you said that they will have that conversation, but who's triggering it? Where's that coming from? Um, second question, I'll maybe just ask them all after, is um, I suppose I was disappointed to hear a couple of weeks ago that they don't at any further assistance, financial assistance in relation to value for money. But um, how would the department, the minister herself, define what value for money is as a government department essentially there to serve the public? Um, you know, I appreciate we can look at this in terms of employment, we can look at this in terms of our return. And yes, you have a bottom line, like every department does, and you need to ensure that um, you, know, you, can, you can wipe your face, forgive the phrase. But as a government department, we are there to serve the public. We do have a responsibility to support them. And I, I, would, I would just be keen to understand what that means to the department and what that uh, means to the minister, because I think that's a key point. If, if you were a profit-making business, I can nearly understand the permanent secretary's comments, but we're not. We're a public service there to, um, to, to look after the people we represent. And there are a considerable number of people in Northern Ireland that feel that that's not happening. So I'd be keen to, to hear your thoughts in and around that um so yeah <laughs> well, Sharon oh sorry would you like me to take that Sharon or do you want to comment no happy enough for you to start sure yeah thank you um in terms of of your first question as to who who triggers that decision um certainly um our the, the economy minister um has put a put a paper at the beginning of the summer um if I recall correctly exploring the options um available 
uh, in, in terms of those grant schemes and, uh, and the other interventions. Um, tomorrow, the executive will be discussing the, their recovery framework um, and looking at the, 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 the key areas um, for COVID recovery um, and all the, the, the number of departments involved in each of those areas to deliver those benefits. Um, therefore, I mean, I can't give you a, 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 a strict answer now as to who will trigger that however it has been our, our minister has put papers to the executive on this issue and it is a live issue of consideration um but certainly we can come back with more detail on, on that point um your second question and i'm sorry i lost a little bit of the the sound um part way through but if i got the gist of what you were asking it was how does the department assess value for money and um, in terms of the interventions in front of us today um, now, now, certainly, we obviously have, uh, as you'll be aware, the civil service has um, has processes and procedures to assess the value for money of any intervention, um, and that is set out within our um, economic appraisal and business case guidance um, to allow us to respond more quickly um, to this sudden crisis of COVID. Um, and those those processes were streamlined. However, each intervention it was still assessed in terms of the costs benefits and risks um, to the Northern Ireland taxpayer. Um, in terms of value for money, it, it is assessed in terms of um, how that expenditure will it will benefit and impact the economy and um, both immediately and in the long term. Um, so those value assessments are made on a case by case basis um, according to those those various inputs and outputs. And does that take into account potential um, unemployment of people who you know may not be able to sustain their business and will then go on to the unemployment queue does that take into account that value and the cost to the taxpayer and looks at the you know the 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 consequences and the impact of not supporting quite a significant group within Northern Ireland um, you could probably tell me better than me you know how, how you know what percentage of businesses within Northern Ireland um, you know make up small medium enterprises and sole traders and self-employed does, does that all take that into account it, it would take in, into account the objectives of any intervention um, and how effective that would be at delivering on those objectives um, and it would take a whole a whole life and a long-term view of those benefits so for example if it, if, it, if it only sustained employment for a short period that would also be taken into account um, against the upfront cost of the intervention. Um, now, I'm speaking um, almost academically here. I'm not, um, I, I wasn't involved in the assessment of, uh, of those specific cases that you're talking about. So, so I'm more talking about the framework um, that we will look to value for money through, but certainly all those, and we call them monetary benefits and non-monetary benefits, uh, and certainly they are all captured in, in those considerations. Yeah. Um, and. I suppose just a further question in respect of this kind of area is around entrepreneurs. Is the department still pursuing new entrepreneurs? Um, you know, and, and I'm mindful of this, particularly because a lot of the people who do feel excluded um, have been entrepreneurs maybe for a very short time. And it's almost like on one hand, we're not supporting the entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs that we currently have yet we're maybe, uh, you know, encouraging new, and, and, and that's not to say that we shouldn't encourage new entrepreneurs, mm. but what sort of message are we giving to, to those who are want to set up a, a new business that if something like this were to happen again, you're not getting supported. So, you know, it, it's a huge risk to do that right now, but how do we balance that need to move forward to recover, um, encourage new entrepreneurship? I do agree with that, absolutely. If we're not going to help the people that are already trying to, to make their way through this, this uh, crisis. Well, certainly there, there were a range of interventions available um, to potential and, and existing entrepreneurs. For example, the loan funding um, that was made available at a UK level. Um, we also looked more locally at, at any gaps within that provision um, to see what we as, as a Northern Ireland executive could offer. Um, out, and you, you'll have noticed in the announcement from, from our minister yesterday um, that equity fund to help those early stage businesses um, who are struggling at UF. If the availability of finance has has contracted as a result of the current economic condition, um, also within within this suite that we have, uh, have put to the the committee today, I mean the, our our top um, prioritised intervention is the Northern Ireland companies in the blue zone, um, and this now it, it's not just um, restricted to small companies, but it's any size of company. Um, 
and to help them undertake R&D and innovation. Um, these were uh, bids that were assessed at a UK level um, and in, in terms of um, funding, funding was only available for, I believe it was 18 of those, of those applications that were in the blue zone, which means they were good enough to pass, they were assessed as good enough to be funded, the funding just wasn't available. Um, so certainly while there may not be, you know, the, the benefits to that grip um, are spread across a range of the interventions that are both before us today and were funded through the June monitoring exercise. And I understand that, but there are still a considerable number of businesses that haven't received anything um, or have received minimal support. And unfortunately, those businesses are not going to survive, particularly if, you know, if things get more difficult as we move forward. And maybe if we don't, they just haven't been given that support up until now. So whilst I appreciate and welcome all the supports that have been provided, I do think it's something that we need to keep pushing because we are we, we are an economy that is made up of small, medium enterprises. And, um, you know, a lot of that is underpinned by sole traders and those who are self-employed. Other jurisdictions have looked towards supporting this group of individuals, and I think Northern Ireland needs to do the same. And I don't think it needs to be a considerable amount of money. I've heard some people talk about £10,000. That would be very much welcome, I'm sure. But I think at this point, these, these businesses ju just want to sh ensure that their business doesn't fold. And I think, um, you know, certainly, and I'm putting it on record, not just with you, but certainly if the Northern Ireland executive are, are listening, I think we, we do need to support those individuals. Um, um, first and foremost, before we start moving on to supporting others who will need support as well, um, it's it's a really challenging time, and um, I, I I do worry. Um, and that huge unemployment figure that your department is anticipating, I think, will be added to if we don't support these individuals. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Claire and Stuart. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, up to now, and apologies if I perhaps go back over some stuff that uh, maybe has been covered in previous meetings, but I I'm just playing catch up. This is my first um, uh, committee meeting since returning to the Assembly. Um, can I start perhaps with the, 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 the issue of um, the broad statement that was made at the beginning with regards to this is all about delivering economic recovery. What have you been doing up to now? Well, I think we have um, divided our interventions. Paul, apologies. Can can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You, you. Sorry, I thought I'd, I sorry I thought I'd frozen there. Um, we have been dividing our interventions in, in, in into phases, and while yes, you're right, we have been um, responding to the COVID cr crisis, which was in terms of the grant schemes that those those initial more intense um, interventions. Um, and we're now looking to the rebuilding phase. Um, so it, it, it's almost just, just a way of delineating those time skills. but you're absolutely right. Everything we do as a department is about supporting um, and rebuilding the economy. You, you made reference to um, some £10 million pounds being returned, and, and, and inevitably there will be um, schemes and funds that do not uh, draw down the full amount of money, and sadly, a lot of it has to be probably because businesses just have gone out of business. Um, but is there no way of monitoring or uh, keeping a constant eye on resources that are being allocated to ensure that we maximise the value? There, there is a lot of disappointment and will continue to be not only disappointment, but probably we will move into a point of anger where um, this department, particularly, uh, will end up returning a great deal of money at the end of the financial year. Now, as I say, this is caveated by saying I do appreciate why, why, why not all schemes will spend all of the resource, but are you driving a situation to ensure that you are maximising this and minimising the return of any funds? Sharon, do you want to take that through the monitoring process? Yes, sure. Um, I, I think, um, it, you know, in answering your question, there, there is a process across government um, led by DOF and, um, you, you know, we come to the committee with the monitoring returns and the purpose of that is to establish quickly where areas are not spending money and to try and re 
that um, either within our own department, as we have had the flexibility in June monitoring and we'll have October monitoring, or surrender to the centre, to DOF, to have that redirected um, and reallocate it to other departments. And I think, you know, in terms of the overall concept of recovery, it is important that um, where funds won't be spent on certain schemes, that they can quickly move to be reallocated because, you, you know, if, if we try to do that in slow time, we're missing an opportunity to get money out into the economy and therefore aid recovery. Um, so, you know, I think we, we are very alive to that as a department um, and it's why we took the decision um, to return to the centre the 10 million of capital funding um, you know where we had a number of underspends um, through uh, capital projects that, that we were, were running. Um, so I think as a department we are certainly very alive with the, the need to do exactly what you say and there are mechanisms across central government to make sure that that's done. Yeah, I, I understand the, the, the monitoring rounds and the purposes of returning money and the need to get it back quickly so it can be reallocated. That wasn't what my question was. My question Sorry. was, what action is the department taking to actually ensure, because we are in very difficult and indeed unprecedented times, what action is the department taking to ensure that the money is being spent and that you don't have to hand it back? <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, Michelle. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I mean, in, in terms of it, it always it, it always is a risk. Um, uh, as you said in, in your opening question, there in terms of getting getting money out, getting it through the approvals process, and ensuring it is spent correctly. Um, we as a department have looked to streamline our spending approval processes to make sure that those decisions, once those allocations are made. That those decisions can be taken quickly um, to ensure that the money is going out to our delivery partners, for example, Invest and I, Intertrade Ireland, um, and they can get they can get those schemes up and running as quickly as possible. Um, we're also working with um, our arms length bodies and the department to ensure that when we make those allocations, we have asked those questions, and I mentioned at, at, at the top of the meeting there that in assessing those bids. One of the criteria we looked at was whether we had confidence at that point in time that the money could be spent in year um, to ensure that we minimise the amount of money um, that has to be either reallocated within the department or handed back to the centre. Um, unfortunately, it is always a, a risk and when we're moving at pace and when the economy economic conditions are evolving um, so rapidly, it is sometimes difficult to estimate exactly how much will be required for an intervention. Um, I'll, I will give the example of the loan funding um, that I referred to earlier. Um, it's very much demand-led. It depends um, on our bank's appetite for risk, um, whether or not, because obviously government will only step in to, to, to lend whenever the the market isn't responding. If the market responds, we can make those schemes available, but they, but they might not have the level of uptake than we had anticipated. And um, so it is. It, it's getting that fine balance um, of ensuring that we have the resources there um, for those schemes should they be required. But also then, if if it turns out that demand hasn't been um, what was anticipated at the time of scheme de scheme demand, and um, that that money can be reallocated as quickly as possible to ensure it delivers benefits in other schemes. Okay. I think um, if I could sort of just add as well to what Michelle has said, in terms of the money that has been allocated to the Department for Economy for COVID interventions, um, we don't have the flexibility. Um, if, if one of those interventions was underspending um, and another one um, was short of money, we don't have the flexibility to move across those schemes without returning back to the Department of Finance as part of um, a, a monitoring um, round for those to be considered by the executive team. And yet, uh, I think the technical term is the ability to veer funds. Surely that you must have learned that lesson by now. So why are you not making a bid to, in reality, to be allowed, in limited circumstances, to veer funds between headings? I, I appreciate the whole thing that you're saying, and I understand that you're highly risk averse to doing anything at wrong financially. That I wholly understand. But have we not learned the lesson that there has to be some flexibility built into the system, and that you should be able to veer some funds? Make a make a logistical argument. Make a make make a clear and robust argument for doing it, and get permission to do it. 
Um, I, we, we are talking to supply about the need to do that because I can certainly see as the year progresses and these funds have to be spent by the 31st of March um, that not having that flexibility you know, could be problematic in terms of spending out the money. Um, but at the minute, um, you know, we do not have that flexibility. That has been a condition of funding set by the Department of Finance. But has the Minister asked for that flexibility? Has she even considered it? Well, well, I am discussing at an official level with the Department of Finance officials. So you are raising it? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, you've heard a lot of discussion this morning about... Uh, those who might describe themselves as excluded, uh, those who have uh, set up predominantly set up in new businesses but failed to be able to access any of the uh, grants up to now. The reality is that those grants were easy to access because they weren't your grants. They were HMRC, they were national government schemes, the furlough scheme uh, and others. Uh, and basically all you were doing was cutting and pasting and allowing them to happen. Why is it that the Department and the Minister um, has failed to look at, for example, what's been happening in Scotland and Wales and trying to replicate uh, for us those sort of more micro schemes that would have enabled excluded new uh, businesses, company directors and others the opportunity to avail of some, uh, some amounts of funding? Is it just quite simply because the department and the minister is risk averse, or is it just too complicated, or you just can't be bothered? Well, we certainly, it. Yeah. Um, certainly, we, we can come back. It's, it's not an area I've been closely involved in, so we can come back to you with more details on that. Um, but I understand, for example, in Scotland. Um, because of different arrangements, they were able to access the data. Um, and in Northern Ireland, um, that wasn't an option um, available to us. Um, I know the economy minister has raised this issue at the executive, um, and all members recognise it would be difficult for Northern Ireland, um, given the high level of administration that would be required um, for that scheme. Um, I also understand the Department of Finance um, has contacted Treasury regarding a number of issues with the UK-wide schemes. Um, and widen, widening the availability um, of the self-employed scheme. Um, Treasury has responded that there's a number of operational reasons um, why the scheme was designed in the way it was. Um, the Economy Minister has further proposed that the Executive should write to the Chancellor to look at it again at some of the people that have been omitted from this scheme and to consider bringing forward further measures across the UK. Um, but certainly we can come back to you with more detail on that. Yeah, I, I understand. That. And, and you know, we, we saw yesterday in the press that, for example, the furlough scheme, there, there, there will be probably a, a reasonable amount of either fraud or mispayments in respect of that. HMRC have a ferocious reputation in being able to recruit all of those things, so I have no doubt that that is what will happen. But it is very concerning that just because somebody says you can't have access to a database, why, didn't, why couldn't we do what we've done in other circumstances with that database and say, well, look, here's the sum of money that we want to allocate. HMRC, use your own database and do it for us. Why couldn't we have allowed others to do these things for us? Yes, there's potentially a risk in respect of that. But the far bigger risk, the far bigger risk, is that these businesses quite simply go to the wall and they end up being individuals who have to claim universal credit. Well... We, we will certainly come back to you with more detail on that. I'm sorry, I'm just not no, not um, as familiar with that scheme. Okay, well, I find it slightly disappointing, Chair, that, that, that an official is telling us that they're not um, a fay with two schemes, one in Wales and one in Scotland, which um, have been successful in drilling down deeper into uh, those in the economy who have been failed uh, so far. I, I find that disappointing at this stage it, it, in the process that that's where we're at. Um, it is important uh, that those businesses that so far have not received support uh, should be identified, um, should be red circled, uh, and every effort should be made to attempt to, to direct funds to them to, to take them forward. This isn't about retrospective support for them. This is about support that they need today. Many of these people are people who have maxed out their credit cards. These are people who have remortgaged their properties and their houses where the banks have allowed them to do that. 
One final question, Chair. This whole discussion this morning has been inside what might be described as the Northern Ireland Brexit bubble. Or sorry, the Northern Ireland COVID bubble. But the Brexit story sits outside all of that. How is the Department, particularly in respect of uh, recovery, um, dealing with the news that is emerging in respect of uh, Brexit negotiations? And is the reality that all of the efforts, and they have been genuine and good efforts that have been made to support business in Northern Ireland with respect to COVID, is now at a perilous risk when it comes to Brexit? That, that, that is a very, very good point, and certainly when looking um, at economic recovery in, through the lens of COVID, you can't ignore EU exit um, and, and the impact on our local businesses. And unfortunately, in terms of business preparedness, um, COVID dealt a body blow um, in, in that businesses were understandably focused on the impact of COVID-19. Um, and those at a crucial time that would have been preparing for EU exit. Um, Obviously, as a department, we are considering um, what we need to do to help businesses prepare for e-exit, um, and, and that is made more difficult um, by the lack of clarity um, around a number of points. Um, but we are working closely with the business community here. We're working closely with Invest and I and, and Intertrade Ireland. And as a department, we are engaging closely with the UK, UK government to push those points um, and to ensure that we have clarity as soon as possible on those questions that businesses are rightly bringing to us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Sinead, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight? Good morning. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, Thank you very much for your presentation um, this morning. Uh, I suppose one of the observations I would make, you know, economic recovery and rebuilding is a long-term project. And yet I feel that some of these bids are very much short-term. I understand that the money must be spent uh, by the 31st of March, but I think we need to think longer term uh, and more strategic in some of our investments into, into these bids. Um, I, I'll take the first one, for example, the, the assistance to business. If you look at them, you know, you've got the Fast Start project, you've got your Catalyst co-founders, your additional funding for invest in innovation uh, and additional support for skills intervention programs. And also then you've got your Northern Ireland screen uh, industry. I have no problem with any of them, but they're all facing towards predominantly big business except for i suppose the innovation support schemes which sometimes i find a, a, a bit or not the innovation support schemes the co-founder scheme which is a bit rich where, where we're actually um supporting new businesses ten thousand each um regarding um giving them 10k each regarding establishing a proof of concept at the same time we have a we are allowing other entrepreneurs that have uh, a business up and running to actually hit the wall. So, uh, you know, I just I, I just think that we are being short sighted in some of the ways that we're actually spending the money. Uh, and and, and in, in, in that aspect, again, um, talking about the short term, I, I would com concur with what um, what, what has been said right around uh, the table today, you know, I think that we have to have more ambition um, going forward for some of these investments. Two weeks ago, we heard from uh, the permanent secretary and he uh, quite clearly uh, was frustrated um, that the, the fact that, that there has been a delay in, in getting these um, schemes and projects out uh, to businesses. He, he has said that he had um, 48 or 46 actual bids, but some of them had, you know, had gone to the wayside because of the lack of time and, and being slow to react from the Department of Finance. And I'm concerned, you know, that we are still going to be very slow at getting these the, these programs right into the community and we are facing probably the worst um, uh, financial and economic crisis that we've ever had here in Northern Ireland and yet we're, we're still um, knee deep in bureaucracy 
um, trying to get these out and the flexibility within the program itself within the, the, the bids is not there and, uh, and I'm concerned you know that at the end of this um, that, that we could be ending up sending money back because of our inability to spend it in the short period of time that we've actually got and that's wasting money and it's taxpayers money. Certainly, I, I don't disagree um, uh, in terms of your latter point, um, and clearly we need a decision on this funding uh, as quickly as possible to ensure this money can be spent. Um, we are where we are, and uh, um, but we're at the beginning, well, a week into September now, um, and we, we as a department have looked to streamline our processes to make sure that, that once decisions are made on this funding, we can move as quickly as possible. Um, however, we need that decision. Um, in terms of, of, of SMEs, um, there are a range of interventions here, um, and we can come back with, with, with more detail showing which will, will support SMEs. Um, but uh, as you've rightly said, the Catalyst co-founder, um, co-founders, sorry, initiative is aimed at, at, at those small businesses. There's no business size limit on the fast start. Um, the screen industry reboot, for example, will, will, will assist SMEs um, and larger businesses. And then, of course, we have quite a, a strong suite of interventions there on the skills that will, that will have benefits across the whole economy. Um, obviously, our tourism sector um, is SM, largely SME based as well. Um, and there, there's a range of good, solid interventions there to help that sector. Um, so SMEs are um, through the core of, of these bids, but we'll certainly come back um, with some more detail just, just showing um, which of these interventions um, will, will, will assist and which SMEs will qualify for. I wonder, can you give me some more details on priority number 10 um, regarding the higher education grants? Because, uh, you know, this this is an escalator too. This is not just this year in, um, mm. interventions. This will have a knock-on effect on, on subsequent years. Can you can, can you give me any details on how that um, how you've worked out that, that scheme and, and that bit as well? Well, I'll actually hand you over to Pierce, um, if that's okay to give a detail on that. Pierce, you're still muted. Apologies, I'm just looking for this one at the minute. Um, is this the 5% increase? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so, so in terms of how, my understanding is that there will be financial appeals to this one. Um, is that correct, Sharon? Yes, it is, Piers. And, um, you know, I think that's mostly what this bid here is about. It's quite small um, in the current year, but yes. it's about um, highlighting the financial tales. So the executive had previously, I think, allocated some money to for a 5% phase increase to student numbers. So, so this bid is um, just... Uh, in there because there are, you know, reasonably significant future financial deals. There's a very small amount needs dealt with in the current year, um, but it's mostly about the, the future years. Can you give me some detail on those mass numbers that are um, uh, in that particular subsequent uh, years? Sorry, I, this, I don't have the detail of that in front of me. I'm happy to come back um, with, with more detail from our skills colleagues. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. I think the one of the things that's been lost, I think it's the most important, one of the most important points is at uh, point six in the annex, page 11, says the COVID job retention scheme has delayed mass redundancies. However, even with this in place, there's been a spike, a spike in the claiming count, at least 89% over the month of April, compared to an increase of 69% for the UK, now stands at 6.1% of the workforce. This increase of 26,500 to a total of 56,200 brings the claiming count back to 2014 levels, with six years of progress lost in a single month. And it's easy for us to sit here and talk about government interventions. But that's not real money, that's taxpayer money that's going to have to be paid back. 
So I said this in the when we were talking uh, yesterday in the assembly plenary session, the sort of eat out to help out scheme is great, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Ultimately, you're going to have to pay for that lunch because it's being subsidised, but you're ultimately going to have to pay for it in your taxes. And the only way we can be certain of um, economic recovery is not with government intervention, but it is with opening up the economy again. I just wonder, could you talk, because the Department for Health has obviously been very prominent throughout this uh, crisis, uh, stating their case and making their case about the importance of observing various uh, restrictions, and I understand the need for that. I wonder, is it time for the Department for the Economy to be as prominent making the case for opening up again and getting this country moving again? And I just wonder, could you talk to that for me for a few minutes? Well, well certainly our minister um, ha has been clear in engaging with the executive um, around the impacts on the economy um, of business closure um, as a result of COVID. And obviously there is a requirement to balance um, the health implications um, and the concerns of the Department of Health with, with, with the economic implications of a shutdown. Mm. Um, I, I, I take your point in that um, that, is, that that is a difficult balance to reach, um, and certainly um, as a department, we are conscious of the of the impacts on various sectors of those shutdowns, but then also conscious um, of the reasons behind them um, and the decisions taken collectively by the executive on this issue. Um, you said that at the beginning of the summer, um, papers had been submitted by the minister about interventions that would help um, those who have been unable to avail of existing schemes and that that paper or that those papers contained a range of options. I wonder, are you in a position to just talk to the committee about what those options would be? Uh, I don't have those options in front of me, but we're, we're happy to come back with more detail on that. But just to be clear, it was submitted at the start of July and the executive is due to have a discussion on it this week, so we can expect a decision on that issue this week. The executive is due, is due to have a discussion on the recovery framework and yes. the overall approach to recovery, um, and across it, it will be a cross-cutting um, approach, taking taking into account all departments across the Northern Ireland executive. But the minister in July flagged up the issue of people who have been, for want of a, a better phrase, excluded. So at the start of July, the minister raised that issue with executive colleagues. The, the issue, the issue has been discussed by the executive, is my understanding. Okay, and we could expect an outcome for those people soon, and if so, within what time frame? Even if it's a negative I, I, outcome a, or a positive one, I just want to know that people are given a decision. I'm afraid I, I, I can't speak today to the agenda um, or, or the time scales that the executive will take around these decisions. No, I understand that. Um, in terms of uh, some of the points that were raised around value assessments, and some people were concerned that you know these value assessments were slowing up and delaying getting money out the door. If you didn't carry out those value assessments, how would you be? potentially legally liable for bad decisions, if you could speak to that. I mean, uh, do you mean in terms of the value for money um, yes. ass assessments that we undertake? Um, yes, we have a requirement um, to ensure, and it's set out within managing public money Northern Ireland, to ensure that all expenditure um, that we oversee as a department um, is regular, proper, and will deliver value for money, and that those assessments are undertaken. Um, if, if we if we push out money that has not gone through those requisite steps as set out within managing public money, um, then that will be a regular spend. Um, now, not illegal, but irregular, um, and would have to be reported to the audit office. Um, it is good. It is. It, we don't just do it because it's a rule within a book. It is good practice. We are responsible for spending public money. Therefore, we we have to ensure that in spending that money, um, we abide by the. Hmm. The regulations are set out within managing public money, and, and and we spend it correctly and deliver benefits for that expenditure. And I would imagine, to be honest, if and there's a final point, I would imagine, to be honest, if you didn't do that, some of those who are decrying you now for not doing it or for for doing it would be at the front of the queue 
uh, condemning you for that. So that's fair enough. Thank you. Good to put John, Guide. Uh, th thank you for letting me back. And again, Chair, th this has been a very interesting briefing session, um, uh, and obviously a very important briefing session too. Uh, I, I have a couple of points, if that's okay, Chair. In terms of Christopher's comments around the paper that was submitted by your minister to the executive in July, did that paper contain a recommendation on how to support those who have been excluded from grant schemes thus far and a costing for those schemes? It contained a range of options um, open to the executive going forward um, rather than recommendations. Right, so options rather than, so the minister has not yet made a recommendation to the executive on how those who have been excluded could be supported. There, there were a range of options set out within that paper. It's a very good answer from a civil servant, but I appreciate you can only say, uh, so I'm not going to harangue you over that matter. I, I'm, I'm looking at the priorities John, again. Sorry, would you take yes. an intervention? Of course, it's Christopher. Can I just, <laughs> can I just clarify? Can I just clarify with you that every one of those options would be to the benefit of those people if it was undertaken by the executive. So the options, so the options, if they were undertaken by the executive, would benefit the people that John has described, the excluded people. I don't have the detail of that in front of me in, in terms of where it was, where, where the options were targeted, um, but certainly we can come back on that point. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to come back to the, the priorities. Uh, and I, I've said this to a number of your colleagues previously, I think I've said it also to the Minister. At the moment, what we have to do is secure what we have um, in terms of our economic base, because it's crumbling around us because of the COVID-19 outbreak. And, and I still see a trend in, in, in some to look too far ahead. Of course we have to have options which are secure now and we also have to look towards a future economic basis. But I am concerned, and this highlights to me in, in the first priorities have, technology companies have been highlighted as businesses who have been missing support available under the various COVID-19 business support schemes. Uh, and Fast Start is aimed at helping the UK's COVID response with the grants are both an economic stimulus for companies, etc. The, the reports, or the variety of reports that I've read in terms of the economic impact, IT and technology companies have actually fared very well because they're not public facing. They don't rely on customers coming through the door. They don't rely on that human contact. And they're, they're, they're ideally placed for remote operating. So why are they your number one priority? And just give me one second to scroll through my papers. And at number nine, uh, just bear with me one second. At number nine, your, number, your priority number nine is the EU social fund. Now, we'll not get into a debate about Brexit and leaving you. But the EU social fund, and I'll quote again from your document, the strategic aim of the European social fund 2420 is to combat poverty, enhance social inclusion by reducing economic activity and to increase the skills base of those who currently work and in future uh, work, or of those currently in work and future potential participants in the workforce surely that should have been higher up your priority list in terms of how we hold what we have how we support uh, the bricklayer the hairdresser the decorator the, the small medium enterprises those who are the core elements of our economy at this stage because the, the global economy is, is, is slowing down if not stopped. So why, why is it so far down your priorities? And the, your number one priority is to help a sector that has fared very, very well during the current economic downturn? Well, I, I would say, first of all, as a general comment on the prioritisations, these bids were all very close. Um, so it's not a case of um, there was significant difference um, in terms of the benefits between, say, number one and number nine, we had to prioritise them and give them individual priorities. Um, so I wouldn't want people to think that those bids to, to, towards the bottom half are in any way poor bids. They're, this is a strong suite of interventions. Um, taking your, your question in terms of the um, fast start, the number one priority, um, yes, you're right, this is a sector that has the potential um, to grow and to, take, uh, and, and to fare well through the COVID impacts. Um, 
it is those types of advantages that we need to seize as an economy. We need to look at where employment opportunities are going forward, and we need to look at value-added sectors. Um, therefore, this bid was scored highly against those, those criteria in terms of value money, in terms of delivering against the programme for government um, and the Rebuilding a Stronger Economy um, document. Um, in terms of the, it was number nine, I believe, the um, ESF fund, you're absolutely right. That is a fund that, that delivers solid, good benefits for the Northern Ireland economy. Um, this proposal was about um, rep replacing that EU funding um, this year um, with resource Dale, basically money from our block, um, and therefore making that avail money available in future years. So therefore, while, while a strong bid um, in looking at the additional benefits it would deliver in year, um, those benefits were not this year, they would be felt in the future because there would still be the same activity this year. Um, but that is not in any way to um, degenerate against against that bid. It is a strong bid. Um, it is it is a solid suite of bids, but we just had to place them um, in number order as part of this process. So can, can we have a copy of your scoring matrix? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is everyone, I think. So thank you all very much for your, your contributions. It has been really useful, and um, we will pick up on, on some points and communicate them back to you. Thanks, Nate. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, I, I just want to pick up on, on one thing, because it has been a matter of much discussion amongst all of us. Um, and including with the, the minister and other ministers in relation to the self-employed and the newly self-employed who have been missed out. Um, we've heard numerous references to the scheme in Scotland that, uh, that, that Stuart mentioned, and we discussed that with the minister at one of the, the committee meetings. We proposed that they do something similar. Um, and I think um, I'd like to propose that the committee writes to the economy minister and the finance minister um, in relation to that, because we have heard about the difficulties of getting that data from... Um, HMRC um, and ask if they will explore the option of funding that if HMRC will deliver it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand, Chair, that it has been a problem trying to get that database from HMRC. The, the Department of Economy have tried, and it's my understanding that it is not available, it hasn't been available to them, and that is one of the reasons why they weren't able to deliver on, on, on that part of the scheme. But yeah, I agree with you. Let's try all the options. Okay. We'll go ahead and do that. Cheryl, so um, all of the um, documentation that members have raised that was mentioned by officials that they have offered to share, we send that forth in the Dallow readout um, and look for that. Okay, thank you. Moving on then to item number five, which is matters arising. Um, and there is a considerable number because it's all over the summer. Um, so, if members want to indicate if there's anything they want to pick up on them as we go through. Um, what page point, is that, sorry? Uh, 5.1 is on page 60 of your pack. Yeah. Right, thank you. Um, and it is res a response from NIO on the establishment of the business ex engagement forum and its work. Um, the response states there's no core list of attendees, attendees sorry, and that a broad range of representatives attend the forum based on their knowledge and expertise of the subject at hand. The response also highlights some clear themes emerging from the discussion, including the integrity of Northern Ireland's goods and products and the need to reflect complex supply chains, which will be no um, surprise to any of us. Um, I think this is one we want to keep an eye on yeah. and continued engagement with um, the, the Business Engagement Forum. Um, and obviously it will be particularly pertinent um, after today. Uh, publication of the Internal Market Bill. Have members any other actions that they want to suggest? Great. Okay. Um, 5.2 at page 62 of your pack is a response from the Minister for Communities concerning support for, um, for the North West 200. Um, DFC has responded directly to the event director in giving information on the hardship. Oh, can people mute themselves? The same message there from the one of can't mute, it's definitely can it muted. Oh, oh Claire can't unmute. Claire can't no. <laughs> Okay. Text as if you need anything. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry, I forgot you. 
almost as if someone was stuck with me from unmuting. I don't know if that's a possibility. Sure, I think it's like when you're transitioning from audience to spotlight, uh, only when you get into spotlight can you unmute. Ah. Okay, right. so can we that makes any sense. Can we just bring Well, no, I wanted to make a point about the last one. Couldn't get in. <laughs> it's, just need to check is John Stewart still yeah. there because he, he had a problem with his system? I'm yeah. still here, Chair. I, I can't see myself. I don't know if you can see me. We can't see you, yeah. but we can hear you. Uh, that square is John. Okay. Claire, if you want to yeah, go that, ahead. That, that black square is me. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Chair. If you want to go ahead, if you, if, did you say you Yeah, sorry, but pardon. Um, it, it was to come in on that last point and gathering data from HMRC. I had made a suggestion in the committee, I want to say it was me now, around potentially opening up a portal where the way they had done with uh, previous uh, grant supports um, to see if you know people would maybe come forward and you know you know express interest and maybe gather data that way. Was there any was there ever any progress on that? Um, and is that an opportunity for the department to try and understand who has been excluded? Chair, we wrote to the minister on that. We also wrote to FM and DFM on that one. Um, the responses we we've got suggested that they weren't explicit on on a particular portal, but they they said that they were looking at options. And I suppose that's kind of one of the options they have to look at if they're trying to get data from HMRC is if HMRC won't sure. won't or can't share it on, on whatever interface they use that some kind of new portal will have to be created for that so in writing to um, the finance and, and economy ministers again we can restate that issue where it would be useful where we can have a portal that will allow information to be gathered Obviously, Chair, we've also been gathering, uh, surveying from all of our stakeholder groups, which again has been sent on to the mm -hmm. Economy Minister, um, FM, DFM, and in some cases the Finance Minister. But we can reiterate that, Chair, um, in the letter that's going forward from this meeting. Uh, please, Chair, I would appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I do think there are ways to do this, um, and, and I would hate to think that HMRC not being forthcoming with their data would be a reason. Um, there's already a precedent in, in the way we have uh, taken forward other portals um, at the beginning of the summer. So I, I do think there's opportunity to do this. And, and I would appreciate if, if the committee would be happy to restate that with the department and indeed the first uh, deputy first minister. Okay, um, okay, so then the Northwest 200, there is a response from DSC um, saying that they have responded directly to the event director with information around the hardship fund for sport and other COVID-19 opportunities. The director has also informed the department they have furloughed all their staff. Have members any uh, actions they want to address? Chair, I would just express my disappointment at this. Uh, the, the event was organised uh, this year. A lot of money obviously was spent and the event had to be cancelled. Sponsors were in place. Sponsors obviously didn't pay out because the event didn't run, and therefore the uh, the Northwest organisers were at, a, at a, a, a huge loss. I'm somewhat disappointed that the communities haven't responded more positively. They do seem to support many other sporting events, but don't seem to have recognised the Northwest for the significance of it and the, the huge event that it is and brings in tourists and you know, a, a, a huge spectacular event, probably one of the biggest public events we have. So um, I'm somewhat disappointed. I do understand um, that the uh, Department of Economy is, is wor working on this issue and uh, hopefully they'll be more positive than the Department of Communities have in, in relation to what is a significant motorsport event for Northern Ireland and indeed attracts people from right across Europe and beyond to see road racing. And uh, I just hope that it's able to survive. It's been the most difficult year for them and uh, been unable to run events so as i say i'm disappointed by the response chair i think we've also communicated with the economy on this uh, I can't it's it's uh, it sits with communities through their sports work it, it used to be the old cal department um mm -hmm. where the economy money comes in is if it's leveraged as part of a tourism package so their support generally only will happen if the event itself is happening um, but as, as Mr Dunn said, um, I understand that there's still discussions going on between the two departments as to what could or might be able to happen next year, either being able to bring back the, the actual format, the normal format, if we're in that situation, or trying to um, bring forward a, a modified format. Members are probably aware of various different schemes that are running across different sports to try and get audiences back, to try and get support back, to try and generate some of that income. 
so this I suppose will fall into that of um, seeing where we are and then seeing where you know the, the, the event can go to where how, how much in its original format can be run Okay, then um, moving on to five. Can speak to that one as well? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, no, I, I agree um, entirely with what uh, Gordon has said. Um, I think more generally, not just the Northwest 200, but other big um, sporting events or just big events generally and the crowds that they attract. And, you know, I know we are just under a year away from those events, you know, hopefully being able to run again. But if we find ourselves in a situation in the next six months to a year where COVID is still becoming a problem, you know, one year without those events running and the various sponsorships, but also the, the visitors that those attract, they sustain, as you know, Chair, um, you know, the, the tourism on the North Coast um, because they do attract the visitors and then it's the, the, the benefits of, of the hospitality and the restaurants that are being used by those crowds but again we have to be mindful that they are you know big crowded events um you know uh, you, you couldn't move in port rush you know whenever the northwest is on or indeed even when the the, the super cup the, the old milk cup is on so is there anything that the department is doing um from a tourism perspective anticipating large-scale events um, not just in my constituency but right across northern ireland if we were to to find ourselves still in this space of of restrictions around covid19 and you know is, is there a longer term view to supporting those events because you know pulling the rug from beneath them one year is bad but over two years we, we could see the end and you know these things have legacies and it would be a shame for them to, to find themselves vulnerable um because we didn't have the foresight to realize that this could go on longer than we had all hoped Chair, if the members are, are content, we write to the department to ask if those kind of contingencies are, are being discussed. I think um, what Ms. Sugden has said is, is the key word there is crowds. With other sporting events, it, it can be managed in a different way if you've got a stadium or, or a particular ground where you know you, you can measure distance. You can um, have moderated flows in and out of the stadium or phase times. With something like the Northwest 200 and some of those other events, it is very much people in giant crowds, it's going to be harder to manage, and then that overflow into tourism as well. So we, we take that forward in terms of writing to the Minister to see what sort of discussions and contingencies are going on there. Okay, right, thank you. Okay, 5.3 then, page 64, is a response from the Minister for Communities, Garden and the Safe Reopening of Businesses. The Minister highlights the importance of clear guidance for businesses and the vital role that local councils have played. Um, are our members content to note? Yes, agreed. Okay. Um, 5.4 then is a response from the Min Minister for Infrastructure um, in relation to the North-South Interconnector, advising she hopes to be in a position to make a decision soon. Are members content to note? Is anyone any further information on it, Chair? We've heard this for a long time. That, that's, that's from towards the end of July. Um, yeah. Any comment, Chair, that there has been sort of publicly, it has been a decision is, is imminent or, or at least is, is very soon. There, there is a time scale for this. Yes. Um, and I, I think that was the understanding where we left it, was that it, it really was very soon. Um, what potentially members might want to do is write again to the Infrastructure Minister to ask for an update on that. Yeah. How soon is, is soon, effectively? Yes, yeah, quite a time now, since the 23rd of July, isn't it? Okay. Members are content, yeah. Great. 5.5 then at page 67 is a response from the Department regarding correspondence um, from a local cargo company, King Group, on the impact of COVID. The Department advises the business property will qualify for the 12 month rate relief. So are members content to note? Mm -hmm. um, page 69 then is correspondence from the Department um, from, from a PhD uh, student, no, sorry, correspondence from the Department regarding correspondence from a PhD student who is conducting research under the US Ireland Research and Development. I think this was shared with the members. Yeah, and went um, on because it was time bound. Yeah. yeah, so are members content to note? Agreed. Um, 5.7 then is a response at page 70 from the Department regarding correspondence from Coffee Conjo on COVID-19 support. The Department advises a successful application has been made to the Micro Business Hardship Fund. So are members content? Agreed. Um, page 72 then there is a response from the department on the timeline for the energy strategy the department advises time scales for the development of a final energy strategy will not delay urgent policy decisions which need to be taken now and that there may be a need to progress some specific policy issues to be considered within the strategy 
Um, this is one obviously we will be looking at with our micro inquiry. Yeah, Chair, we, we'll be ringing that fortune. Uh, the department is still going ahead with all the research that they had talked about. Um, they talked about a lot of research being published uh, August, September, October. That's all still coming out, so that work has continued. It's it's one of the uh, strategies that's clearly moving along the time scale that it had. I think there's there's some level of um, I don't want to say delay, but it, it may be a longer time scale than originally envisaged. But it is one that's still working. Um, I don't want to say as normal, but you, you know what I mean. It's it's still progress. I, others I don't have... want to say delay, but it's a longer time scale than originally envisaged. You'd know you were a civil servant, Peter. <laughs> it's a long number of years where you, you're careful about how you think. Right. Um, but it, it's it's happening. Okay, well, we'll be coming back to that one in due course anyway. So our members content? Great. No for now. 5.9 then, there is a response at page 73 from the department regarding job losses at Titanic Belfast. Um, members probably received the, the correspondence in relation to that. The department states that the job losses are regrettable and outlines um, advice services available. And the department states that Titanic Belfast chief executive is a member of the Tourism Recovery Working Group and the department Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland will continue to work closely with Titanic Belfast as one of our premier tourist attractions and the rest of the tourism industry as recovery will require significant and collective effort. Um, Chair, my understanding is the issue isn't so much the attraction, which is now up running against the events. Um, I'm sure members will have been to a lot of events in that Titanic mm -hmm. building. It's, it's one of the key hubs uh, for that because it's got that range of different sizes. You've got that staircase room and so on. So while those events can't take place, a lot of those staff that were connected to that um, there isn't going to be work for them, but the attraction itself has opened again. Once guidelines are have moved on, I think around events, that business will pick up. But in the meantime, Chair, you might recall we had briefing um, around events tourism, yes. sort of towards the start of the summer, and it really is just that thing of how many people can you have in a space, can you yeah. manage the distancing, and so on. So. It's, it's a very tricky one. Um, I guess the concern being expressed in that letter was around the, the consultation that was being conducted with um, workers. And I think we should just highlight what is being said in the letter in relation to any who believe they've been treated unfairly, that they, they should um, contact the Labour yeah. Relations Agency. And Chair, that's probably uh, an opportunity to, to mention that as part of the bids um, that we we're looking at this morning, Labour Relations Agency has got an increase in staffing, or there's a bid in for an increase in staffing for these kinds of purposes. Okay, thank you. Are members content? Mm -hmm. Great. 5.10 then, there is a copy of a response at page 75 from the Departmental Solicitor's Office to local retailers regarding retail, tourism and leisure grant scheme and the failure of government grant schemes to support multiple groups. DSO states that a number of options were discussed by the executive, but it decided not to provide additional funding for this area at this time. Um, are members content to seek a copy of this correspondence to the department to seek clarification on whether DFE is still considering specific support for multiple um, local multiples as part of its bids? Yes, right. Um, 5.11 then, there are some follow-up papers at page 76 um, provided by Money and Pension Service after they briefed us on the 1st of July. Um, are members content to promote the initiatives outlined in the Money and Pension Service such as the Talk Money Week and the Money Navigator Show? Yes. Great. Um, 5.12 then, there is a report at page 79 commissioned by the Department on the Institutional Design to Support an Integrated Economic Skills and Innovation Policy Agenda. I think this is one we'll want to come back to yeah. a later date. Are yes. our members content to note yeah. for now? Yeah. Yes. 5.13 then, there's correspondence to page 95 from Co Coach Operators NI requesting an urgent meeting with the committee regarding support for the industry. Um, members, they will recall the executive has not made any decision on support for the coach and taxi industries and that their regulation falls to the Department of Port Infrastructure as was emphasised by the Permanent Secretary and any decision to support them would be part of those uh, bids that I think we're hearing that the executive is discussing. Today, or tomorrow, sorry, yeah. yeah. Do members have any additional actions they want to suggest on that? We have written to the Department um, on these a couple of times. Yeah. Um, I think there's at least two letters um, went in on yeah. that chair. Um, obviously, we respond to um, the um, coach operators and, and indicate to them that this this will be an executive decision. And 
this, but we like to. The but that we have flagged it up. Like to express that we want to see this one but sorted out. Yeah, like, Chair, um, my understanding is that there is a representative of that industry on the working group that the minister established. Isn't that right? Um, yeah, as far as I know, yeah. Um, is it wider transport? I can check on that, Chair. No, it's um, just, I mean, it is. I think it's important that they can come in uh, and meet the committee. Scheduling may well be our issue. Then. I, I'm not. I'm not opposed to that in principle because, like, I have my constituency office in Sandy Row, and literally around the corner is Alan's Tours, which is a coach operator. And I mean, they are getting a, a, a very difficult time for them at the present time. And there's also then. As you know, um, strictly speaking, I, I don't I think the city hall might, strictly speaking, be North Belfast, but that's sort of centre of the town. Yeah. You know, the operators, you would have seen them sort of selling stuff outside the city hall and the grounds there, and it's just not possible at the minute, and they are taking a hammer. Um, so, I think that the, the way we discussed last week that we are quite packed in terms of our schedule, but maybe it's one that the deputy chair and yeah. I could um, Do you arrange have a meeting content? with. Them yeah, and that's fine. discuss the issues if everyone is content. Yes, yeah. that's fine. Chair, yeah. think, just I think we'd all you know re-emphasise the need for this support when you consider the, the fall off in tourism, the lack of events, the lack of parades, and you know, all the orange parades and all the band parades are all supported by bus companies, and uh, we're engaged in them. The airports are, you know, low, running at very low capacity. So all of this has had a huge impact on them. And some of them have had, you know, little or no business this, this year. And I do, once again, I would all urge that the executive look very seriously at this and try and come up with some, some support. We've, we've voiced our opinion on many occasions here and written on a number of occasions back and forward. And um, I think we're all of one mind that this group needs support, and I hope it's addressed very shortly. Okay then, so mm -hmm. moving on to um, 5.14, there is a response to page 96 from the Association of British Insurers regarding information provided by the Committee on Individual Insurance Claims. As stated in the evidence to the Committee, the ABI highlights the majority of insurance policies provide cover for day-to-day -day risks, such as fire, flood, theft and accidental damage. The outcome of the test case being taken by the Financial Conduct Authority is expected later this month. Um, so will be members be content to forward the response from ABI to the individuals who have provided the information to the committee? Um, we will also keep an eye to that yeah. FCA case. What's the issue in dispute in the case? So um, they are doing a test case where they are gathering information around those who weren't able to get the um, business interruption insurance. Okay. And there are they've taken it to court to see if the clauses in the individuals' um, contract. Yeah. Are what are can be upheld. So is, it, is it effectively trying to define code as almost like an act of God for insurance well, services? Or? In a lot of cases, it's it's because businesses were told to close down, which is where the business and interruption scheme comes in. Um, whereas insurers are saying, no, well, no, this is pandemic. You weren't insured for pandemic. Right. Um, and then sometimes, more specifically, they're saying you weren't insured for COVID, on your COVID which. <laughs> This time last year, nobody really existed. existed. <laughs> that's, as the chair says, that's why the test case is, is going through. Because right, okay. if they can get the business interruption yes. insurance, then that, that would be apparent for an awful lot of businesses. Okay. Um, so we'll see what happens then later on in the month. Okay. Then we'll have the insurance industry in different support. <laughs> <laughs> chair, there, there are a lot of issues surrounding insurance, some of which wouldn't yeah. necessarily fall into our remit, but um, going on to the tourism thing. Many tour companies now operating, uh, now offering co inclusive COVID cover, but I think you probably need to understand exactly what that does actually do for people. Um, and the other one, which probably is probably probably more infrastructure than us, is the whole issue. But it doesn't it does affect employers. Um, individuals have been told to go and negotiate on their individual car insurance, but. But employers who provide fleet vehicles and all of that, if I go back to your bus operator, if your bus operator has maybe maybe one bus operating with ten sitting in the mm -hmm. yard, but he still has to keep them insured. Yes, that's right. Um, what nego you know, how, how are these people what sort of level of negotiation that's going on to In terms of off them? the road, yeah. Yeah. But actually it's it probably um, would be a useful query to go back to the ABI on if members are content. Yeah. yeah. Fleet vehicles, the whole lot. Okay, Thank that's you. great. 
So moving on then to item number six, um, there's a statutory instrument, the Prohibition of Quantitative Restrictions and Equivalent Measures Cessation EU Regulations 2020. I follow you right, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a letter from the Minister at page 100. Um, um, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy has sought the Minister's consent for a statutory instrument which ends the application of rights going from EU treaty provisions which prohibit the imposition of quantitative restrictions and equivalent measures on imports and exports within the EU after the end of the transition period. However, the articles of the treaty will continue to apply here by virtue of the protocol. So the Minister has liaised with the Minister for Agriculture and agreed that since we do not yet know what protections will apply in the internal market, uh, we are not yet in a position to provide consent for this. Um, so the Minister intends to write to BES to ask for further detail on how the legal effect will be given to the plan set out in the white paper um, on the internal market and how business here will be protected from discrimination. Um, so that's basically it. Noted. Because it's an SI chair, there's, there's no sort of um, LCM equivalent for, for us to intervene on. So this is really what the Minister is handling this and keeping the committee informed. Okay. So number seven, there's an SL1 on the carriage of dangerous goods and the use of transportable pressure equipment amendment EU exit regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 103 and the SL1 as at page 105. The purpose of the rule is to correct um, legislation that would otherwise cease to function properly on protocol completion day. The regulations also partly implement the protocol by maintaining alignment with the EU's regulatory regime on transportable pressure equipment. So the SR is subject to draft affirmative procedure before the Assembly and it's anticipated the rule will come into operation on the 31st of December. Um, so this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the LCL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the business office. So, there's anything you want to add? It's, it's another one of these um, ensuring safety protocols are in place um, to the end of the transition period and beyond the end of the transition period. As members will appreciate transportation of dangerous goods and goods under pressure and so on is one of those things you don't want to have unregulated. So this will allow that regulation regime to continue. Obviously, as the um, SL1 states, where, where this um, deals with manufactured goods, that falls under the protocol, assuming the protocol is there. Um, but it's just to legislate around that so that we will have existing regulations in place assuming. come the end of the transition. Assuming? We, we are where we are. <laughs> Great. Oh, no, I'm just going to policy, yeah. <laughs> Um, item number eight then is an SL1 on Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 Relevant Period Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. There's a clerk's memo at page 115 and the SL1 is at page 117. The purpose of the rule is to extend some of the temporary modifications to the corporate insolvency legislation that were included in the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 until the 31st of December 2020 and others until the 30th of March 2021. The SR is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure before the Assembly and it's anticipated the rule will come into operation on the 29th of September. Um, this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy as laid out in the SL1 and it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the business office. You know, so what, this is literally just extend it is. the deadline. Members may recall we talked last week that there had, before COVID, been a, um, a plan to legislate with a, a, a local bill on this. COVID has overtaken that, so there have been piecemeal regulations that apply particularly to COVID. This is really extending that out so that the insolvency um, mitigations and so on will be extended. Um, the, the initial, members will recall, there was an initial three month period and these are being extended just so that they cover at least to the end of the year. And then I'm assuming there'll be a, another review point. Most of these measures, there's a, a flowing review. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on then to number, item number nine, there's an SR 2020-117, the Northern Ireland Screen Commission funding order, Northern Ireland 2020. There's a clerk's memo at page 121 and the SR and explanatory memorandum are at page 122. The statutory rule will regularise how the department makes grant and aid payments to Northern Ireland Screen to allow it to increase commercial activity 
or employment in relation to the screen industries in the Northern Ireland. Um, I think we, we considered this one be just before recess, yeah. ASL. Yeah, members may recall going mm -hmm. back, uh, there was a very complex fund funding structure for um, Screen NI, 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 NI Screen, um, between what was CAL and what was DETI. And that has continued to evolve and it has now much more come under the um, economy remit in terms of stable core funding. And that's really just to regularise that so it's not um, as ad hoc as it had been. So there'll be, there'll be a core stream. Okay, so the, sta the examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on the rules. So members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. The rule is subject to affirmative resolution. So are members content with the SR? Agreed. So that the Committee for the Economy has considered the Northern Ireland Screen Commission funding order Northern Ireland 2020 and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly subject to the examiner's statutory rules report. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so there is an SR then, um, item number 10, SR 2020-145, the Education Student Support Amendment number 2, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. There's a clerk's memo at page 129 and then the SR, an explanatory memorandum at page 130. Um, this rule rectifies the omission of a figure from the Education Student Support Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, SR 2020 number 79 for the academic year 2020-2021. The amendment is of a technical nature and is in relation to one figure omitted from a table of figures to be increased by inflation. Um, we also consider the SL for this. The rule came into operation on 7th of August. Um, the examiner of statutory rules also has not reported on this uh, rule, so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. And the rule is subject to negative resolution for members' content. Uh, the Committee for the Economy has considered the Education Student Support Amendment Number 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rules subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report. Uh, number 11 then is SR 2020-178, the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. There is a letter um, from the Minister, page 136, um, there's an SL1 at page 139, and then the SR, an explanatory memorandum at page 144. Um, the purpose of this statutory rule is to provide greater certainty in the calculation of a week's pay and to ensure furloughed employees do not lose out as regards certain statutory entitlements which relate to the termination of employment by having been furloughed if their employment is terminated while or shortly after they have been furloughed under the job retention scheme. So the department has apologised for the breach of the 21-day rule in laying the SL1 and the regulations together, outlining it's necessary to ensure employees' entitlements are protected. The rule came into operation on the 14th of August, and um, the examiner statute rules has not yet reported on this, so we will be agreeing to the legislation subject to that report. The rule is subject to negative resolution. Obviously, I think it's one that the committee will be endorsing of. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. So the Committee for the Economy has considered the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996 Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the rules subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules Report. Great. Lovely titles. Item number 12, then, is departmental consultation on the transposition of 2019 Electricity Recast Directive EU. 2019-944. There is a departmental briefing paper at page 158 and then a draft consultation paper at page 161. The department is proposing to carry out a consultation on proposals for transposing the EU Electricity Recast Directive 2019 to ensure domestic legislation reflects EU law. The transposition deadline is the 31st of December 2020. And the directive outlines rules for generation, transmission, distribution, supply and storage of electricity together with consumer protection aspects. It also contains rules on retail markets um, for electricity. So are members content with the draft consultation? Great. Um, Peter, there doesn't seem to be a deadline in that consultation. Is this for submissions or...? Yeah, I, which was a bit, I, I don't know whether that was, well it has to be an oversight because you don't end the consultation, but it might be worth getting um, information on that from the department actually. Yeah. It, 
it did occur to me, Chair, as well. Um, and can we just seek agreement that uh, we will respond to the department to indicate the committee will act as a super consultee and we will uh, receive an oral briefing on the results of the consultation prior to the legislation coming Agreed. before the Assembly? Agreed, yeah. Okay then, um, moving on to item number 13, which is our forward work programme. Um, there is a draft forward work programme at page 191, which we are revising yeah. already. Um, expert witnesses, uh, the committee agreed last yeah, week. Chair, we have two. Um, we have Paul McFlynn from the Nevin Institute. We have Richard Ramsey from the Ulster Bank. We now also have um, Katie Howard, Dr. Katie Howard from Queen's, who's going to talk to us about what we need to know in terms of the UK internal market bill, if it happens today. I think she's already done a lot of background work. There's a lot of um, research out there already that the Scottish and Welsh um, parliaments have both made representations on, so there's quite a bit of information already. So she would be the third um, expert. Um, and there's other items when we get through our um, correspondence that we'll come back to for, for the Ford Work Programme. But we'd have the Minister then on the 23rd. Um, invest won't be the 30th. We have other scheduling for the 30th. Invest would move to the 14th of October with Tourism NI on the 7th. They want to talk to us about the bids and I think it'll give members that opportunity to really explore all of that advertising funding and so on. Um, we, we've only gone as far um, as putting in one briefing for slots to give us a bit of flexibility as members can see you know sometimes depending on the briefing that that might be all we want to do uh, especially with the likes of the minister and so on okay. but we will there'll be updates as we go through the rest of the the meeting pack okay so are members content with that so far are are the starleaf members still there Violet. yes Okay. 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 okay, moving on After then. After 22 to minutes, it just falls effective. Um, to item number 14, which is correspondence. And again, there's a considerable amount of correspondence. Um, 14.1 is a response at page 195 from the Finance Minister regarding the committee forwarding the paper the committee forwarded from the Dairy Chamber regarding PPE procurement. The Finance Minister has proposed a local PPE MEC strategy to, the executive, to executive colleagues which should be led by the Department of Health, given its experience and the level of demand for PPE. So are members content to note? Agreed. 14.2 then, uh, page 196, is a response from the Minister for Infrastructure regarding, regarding the reopening, recovery and rebuilding of the economy, outlining work by councils and highlighting the role of planning and transport systems in economic recovery. Are members content to note? Agreed. 14.3 then is a copy of correspondence at page 199 from the Finance Minister to the Chair of the Finance Committee regarding 2020-21 uh, COVID-19 urgent allocations. As the committee is already aware, the Executive agreed that 53 million held centrally for business support is now part of the Executive's overall response to economic recovery and remaining funding decisions are to be made by the Executive. So our members can tend to note. Agreed. 14.4 then is a copy of correspondence at page 203 from the Committee for Health to the Department for Economy regarding financial support for carers unable to work due to the pandemic, um, during the pandemic due to caring responsibilities but had no access to furlough. The Health Committee agreed to write to the Department of Health to ask that it work closely with all relevant departments to agree a means of providing support to carers. So our members content to note. Chair, just can we, can we ask for... Gary, can we move back into the spotlight, please? There you go. I wonder where Claire's gone now. And Claire, so, yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, 14.5 and 14.6, there's correspondence from the Committee for Finance at page 205 and the Committee for Health at page 209 regarding the Dairy Chamber paper and PPE yeah. procurement. Both committees are supportive of a local production um, recognising the importance um, of the opportunity for local businesses to diversify their products and establish new supply chains. So our members can tend to know, given the response that we've had. Yeah, I think it's to be welcomed, Chair. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot of work um, setting up your production systems and processes, but and doing it cost-effectively is a big challenge. That's, 
I suppose the main thing, but there's such a huge demand now and probably will be for some time. So I think we'd welcome the progress that has been made on that. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Oh, also through the chair. Yep, go ahead. Uh, can I say that, you know, that, that is one of the bids more or less coming through um, with the, the support for, for businesses. And it is important that we fast track um, those businesses that actually have uh, repurposed themselves uh, and supplied goods. Uh, that we're facing the health service in particular, and it's good that um, that those businesses now will get some support through that bid. But it's also important that the procurement procedures are also supportive um, of those companies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, moving on then to fourteen point seven at page two hundred and sixteen, this correspondence from excluded NI which, as, as we know, is a lobby group formed to engage with um, elected representatives in the interest of those who couldn't ac ac access the emergency COVID-19 funding, including the hardship fund, excluded and I wish to give evidence to the committee. Um, so, Chair, we're looking at scheduling that in for next week. Um, we have our, our slot with our experts, <coughs> and then because we have um, gone through the, the pretty much all of the correspondence and other... Uh, material we have, we can do a second briefing. So, if members are then we schedule them in for next week. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, Fourteen point eight. Then there is a copy of correspondence at page two hundred seventeen from the Legislation, Justice and Constitution Committee in the Welsh Parliament to the UK Business Secretary and the Secretary of State for Wales. The committee is concerned about the inadequate time frame and engagement with devolved legislators, uh, legislators yeah. on the UK <laughs> internal market white paper and outlines a series of questions for the UK government. The committee believes the UK bill could impact on how the Shannon legislates in the future. Um, so. This is, Chair, this is one we, we put in a, I think we probably wrote that before the last couple of days. Um, obviously, once we've spoken to, or we've heard from Katie Hayward next week, once we know what's being published today, I'm trying to keep an eye on my email to see if anything has been published, but no one has flagged anything up to me. So, we'll be in a better position then to know what we're writing for and about so if if members mm -hmm. are willing to wait until next week okay. when we hear that briefing yep that's great great so 14.9 um at page 222 is there a, there's a request from development trust ni to brief the committee on their recently published report from coronavirus to community wealth build, building back better in ni in collaboration with the center for local economic strategies I think it would be useful to hear yeah. from them in terms yeah. of economic recovery. We now have some space, so we might look at bringing them in on the 30th. Okay. Um, I'm saying that now, no doubt that space will be squeezed very soon, yeah. but we'll, we'll go for that. Um, at 14.10 then, there is a request at page 253 from the um, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, Business and Human Rights Forum, um, to give evidence to the committee, committee on its action plan, which includes work with the Ethical Trading Initiative to promote best practice on securing supply chains, avoid exploitation. Um, and I think that's a really important issue. It is, Chair. I don't. You might recall, Chair, Mr. Dunn might recall from from the Economy Committee before the hiatus um, that the committee agreed that I would sit on the forum on the committee's behalf and report back. Um, are members content to put that mechanism back in place so it means there's a permanent um, like committee presence there? And then we seek a briefing as well. Um, obviously, this has become more of an issue now um, in terms of um, current rules around migrant numbers and so on changing. So this is likely to become a much, much bigger issue. So uh, we schedule in a briefing that members are content. Right. Yeah. Right. 14.10 then, there is correspondence at page 256 from a parent concerned that her son has a place on a construction engineering course but there is no recruitment for apprenticeships, apprentices by a construction company. Um, are members content to forward to the department for a comment on the issues raised and the impact of the new um, apprenticeships and yeah. incentives? Chair, just so members are aware, I've, I've actually continued corresponding um, with this lady. so. Things have moved on, and yeah. it, it looks like there was good news in the end. Um, so we, we'll see where we are with that, but it, it may actually have already been resolved with the announcements that have been made uh, around apprenticeships. So I, I keep committee informed on that one. Okay. Um, correspondence then at page 257 from a student at Queen's regarding the impact of COVID-19 on teaching and access to facilities 
and impact on future prospects um, and requesting that students should not have to pay full fees this year. So are members content to forward that to the department? Great. Um, 14.13 then. Is Hi, sorry, Chair, can I, I just stop that uh, for a few moments? I've had a number of constituents ringing me as well, and I'm sure I've been in contact with, with all of our members within the Economy Committee. This is a real concern for, for our young people going forward in relation to the quality of their experience within um within the university and uh, and no reflection on on fees or or support um i think that rather than just refer it to the uh, to the minister we should possibly discuss it further and what we would as a committee believe would be the right thing to do in in relation to this yeah that's grand um and it's one Obviously, there's some issues um, in the press around the support for students as well. So, yeah, happy to. We bring that as an agenda item, Chair, and we can discuss. Okay. Um, moving on then to 14.13, and there's correspondence at page 258 from an individual regarding A level results outlining there was no allowance for students resetting AS modules or for special circumstances such as illness. So, are members content that we, cor or we forward this correspondence to the Education Committee? Asking they raise it with the minister. Great. Okay. Um, correspondence then at page two hundred and fifty nine from a business owner regarding the self employment income support scheme and the exclusion of some businesses who've been unable to access any support during the pandemic. We've agreed some items around that already, but are members content to forward this to the department for comment also? Yes, great. Um, 14.15 then, there's correspondence at page 260 from the Speaker regarding the establishment of the Youth Assembly and encouraging committees in the future to seek views of the Youth Assembly to get a broader perspective. Um, what's Chair, having, having, to do having that? written that paper as part of my hiatus work, um, I would strongly recommend uh, what the Speaker is saying there. The Youth Assembly, we're still at an early stage. Um, we're into the co-design phase now with the sector and with young people, but um, once that's up and running, the ideal is that committees um, in the Youth Assembly will interface directly with committees of the Assembly so that young people would have a, a frontline say on policy and legislation. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so it's a very opportune time that their voice is heard as well. 14.16 then, there's correspondence at page 263 from the Energy Efficiency Group NI regarding what it believes is the lack of vision in the current energy policy and concern at the time frame for policy measures to result in any support for industry. Are members content to forward this to the Department for Comment? We take it they made a submission to the Chair on the Policy Review. Review? I think they made a submission to our micro-inquiry as well. Um, so it, it, it forms part of the evidence base we now have going forward towards um, committee views on the energy strategy. So, yeah, we can forward it, but I think the committee or the department already has that. Okay. Um, 14.17, then there's a press release at, at page 267 regarding the Ulster University School of Medicine at McGee and the recruitment of doctors for September 2021. Um, I'm sure we're all really happy to see that one. Yep. So, are uh, members content to note? Moving on yes. then, 14.18, there is the ISNI Investing Activity Report for the 30th of August. Are members content to note? Great. Um, page 274, there's a copy of the Examiner of Statutory Rule 17th report. Are members content to note? Good. 283, then there's a copy of the Examiner of Statutory Rule 18th report. Are members content to note? Great. Yep. Um, then a 14.21 at page 290, there is a press notice from the utility regulator announcing Mr. John French as the new chief executive. Um, and I believe we're going to try and skip to them in yeah, some point. Yeah, sure. members may have, have come across John when he was chief executive of the Consumer Council. Yes, yes. So Very I welcome. think he, he moves at the end of the month. Yeah. I think it's at the end of the month. So we look to schedule it. Obviously, we were due a, a, a utility regulator. Um, briefing anyway, so we schedule in once he's arrived. Okay. We wish him well in his new post. Oh, Chair, he, he's done a good job in the Consumer Council. Yeah. Yeah. He's very approachable and very responsive. Yeah, and so I hope he continues. Wish Jenny well. And, um... yeah. She's retaining her chair of the um, 
Ulster University Council. So she'll still be in contact. Okay. 1422 then, there is a report at page three of your table papers um, by the Economic and Social Research Institute on cross-border trade in Ireland from the perspective of the supply chain participation of Northern Ireland inputs into onward exports from Ireland to countries that have free trade agreements with the European Union. Um, I think maybe one we want to come back Better to it's, as it's, well. It is, it's very interesting. It's, it's yeah, now it's potentially really slightly out of date. Um, but I think it's, it's good background for um, hearing from Katie next week. Yep. 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 Um, 1423 then, there's correspondence at page 38 of table paper from the arts sector regarding the impact of COVID-19 and the importance of the sector to economic recovery and calling on executive ministers to work together to support the sector. Um, I think that's one we all, all would agree with. Are members content to forward mm -hmm. that to the department? Great. Yeah. Okay, 1424 then, um, there's correspondence at page 40 of table papers from the managing director of a travel agency and tour operator business regarding access to COVID-19 financial support and the severe impact of the pandemic on operation of businesses. And um, again, it's one, an issue we've raised a number of times, but I think it would be, if we can send this on to the department, it's, do members have any other suggestions they want to make around it? sector we hadn't heard from uh, on an individual basis like this where you've got an individual literally that you know how their, how their business has been impacted um we we looked at it as part of um you know some of the umbrella groups we've spoken to yeah. before but this is you know it's very specific yeah, there, there are a number of travel agents who have now been ringing to individual yeah. members in their constituencies setting out the plight of the travel industry yeah, I think we obviously will send it to the department, I think, in the yeah. first instance. Great. And then we can see what they come yeah. back with in mm -hmm. response. Okay, moving on to 1425, there's correspondence at page 45 of table papers from an airline pilot who was made redundant regarding the differences in the assistance available in England through the Rapid Response Service as compared to here. Are members content to send this to the department for a response to the yep. issues being highlighted? Great. And then 1426, there is um, page 46 of table papers, a copy of the examiner strategy rules 19th report. Mm -hmm. Are members content to note? Agreed. Um, so, any other business? Chair, just wanted to flag up and ask members um, in terms of the, the trade bill, um, we, we talked about this before the summer. The trade bill was introduced to the Commons on the 19th of March. Um, it's now completed as far as report stage in the Commons and yesterday went to second reading uh, in the Lords and now we'll go to committee. Um, the Minister wrote to the Speaker on the 19th of May indicating that um, she wanted to talk to executive colleagues before bringing a legislative consent motion to the Assembly. I'm assuming that's being seen as a legislative consent memorandum indicating that she wasn't bringing one yet and it was still under discussion. Chair, what, I, what I'm asking members to do is if they're content, we write to the Minister to seek clarification on where this all stands now. Um, I'm just very conscious that um, we haven't seen a legislative consent motion and if one is not forthcoming, then we, we need a legislative consent memorandum as to why it's not forthcoming. So if members are content, we'd seek clarification from the Minister. Yes. To it the, yeah, yeah. So the, some media speculation about our media commentary on it this morning. My latest update from the department was it's it's still being discussed with executive colleagues. So it's just getting that in writing, I suppose, just for clarification's sake, chair. Yes, content. Okay. So um, then, finally, item number sixteen is the date, time, and place of our next meeting, which is Wednesday here in this room. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, members on Starleaf. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.